Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, and today we're going to bring on a special guest, someone that I've known for about a decade and I've uh, grown very fond of. Uh, he, you know, we talk about people on here that have, you know, lived a movie script. Well, we're going to kind of, he definitely lived a movie script, but it's kind of from a different angle, a different perspective. His name is Paul Zaberski, uh, former uh, attorney in the Detroit mob, kind of an in-house counsel for the Jackaloni crew for 20 plus years. And uh, I hope I'm not offending you when I, when I say uh, you had a reputation around town for a while as kind of a Macomb County fixer, quote unquote. Well, yeah, absolutely. It's, that's a fact. It's not, <laughs> okay, so you I, just know, I mean, whatever they made it public, you know what I mean? There's not another lawyer in the state of Michigan that has as many cases thrown out as me, and there's nobody even close. I mean, there's 35,000 lawyers in the state of Michigan, yeah. and not one will step up and challenge me on that. But, Paul, you know, uh, you know I met him in, in some of my reporting uh, duties, and, uh, again, he this guy is just has so many great stories. He has written a book called From Pepperdine to Prison, which discusses his roller coaster. Uh, career in law as well as getting caught up in a uh, a, a drug case uh, about what six years ago yeah he's it, it, running, it, for, it, he's running it, for judge yeah just to clarify i mean there's not one person ever other than the fbi that classifies this as a drug case uh okay do you well, know we can talk, we can, to, we, can I mean, we can talk uh, about your we can talk about your case but, oh i don't care about talking about my case but do you know what i went to prison for <laughs> Well, I, really I know it had to do with trying to oh. secure, you know, uh, s s cocaine for social events. It didn't really look like mm -hmm. you were necessarily Actually, I went to selling cocaine. I went to prison because I, on my third indictment, I was facing 105 years and a $10 million fine, and I would not cooperate with the federal government. I mean, I had heard things about the federal government. I was a fan of the FBI until I got targeted. When you get targeted, you either flip to give information or you go to prison you let yourself get jammed because there's no other alternative well they use what are called gustapo tactics they bleed them till you plead them so on my third indictment i was just running out of money you know i mean i've been a millionaire three times in my life okay and from where i come from i really didn't care about the money well you can say that when you have it you know <laughs> yeah and when you don't it's a little bit harder so I wrote this book more as a public service than anything else. I had no idea on how corrupt the federal government was and what well, they will do to uh, get information from you. You know, and, and we know yeah. that the area that you came from, Macomb County, has been under scrutiny. You know, well before your case hit, and oh, now yeah. well after your case well, has Scott, been put it this way. adjudicated for being a kind of a uh, a hotbed of corruption. Yeah, well, put it this way. We only had two prosecutors, what they call them district attorneys in other cities, in the last 50 years, both were federally indicted. And the amount of corruption, now you got to put it in perspective, there's only 800,000 residents in Macomb County, Michigan, often called the most corrupt county in the United States. There's 10 million in LA County. There's 5 million in Cook County. There's 5 million in the boroughs in New York, in Miami, I don't know, 3, 4 million, you know, <laughs> In, in now, political corruption is now number one on the FBI hit list, mm -hmm. overtaking child pornography, uh, pedophilia, uh, bank robbery, cartels, mob activity. Political corruption is number one. So when they see a guy like me, a lawyer, a def criminal defense lawyer with access to information, which I have a ton of, which I was sitting on for 30 years, and I shut my mouth, and I watched all kinds of egregious activity mainly in the courts, judges, prosecutors, and law enforcement. And I shut my mouth. I kept quiet. They knew when I was running for judge, it was like a perfect storm. I mean, it was an eye of the, of the storm. Here, we'll just press on this guy or squeeze him. He'll give us information, and we can continue our investigations, you know. And their main target was our prosecutor, Eric Smith. When I got so many cases dismissed, well, it made sense to them. And I own a condo in Colombia, Medellin, Medellin, what I call it Medellin, Medellin, man, you know, in Colombia. I own a condo over there. So 
they put in the in the newspapers that I was trafficking two kilos of cocaine from Detroit to Medellin, right? I mean, what's the fucking I, well and just so people understand, I you know, I've read the I've read through the case file. The people that uh, Paul was dealing with in these narcotics transactions, th these were not mobsters or drug kingpins. No, Th these were like small, you know, relatively small time. Uh, Absolutely, but see, they lead the Detroit bigger things. You got to remember, I'm going to Me Mexico with the head, with the, the president of the Teamsters Union. I'm going to Mexico with the chief judge on the circuit court in Macomb County. You know, all these political big shots and all that stuff, and. You know, I know people in law enforcement and, you know, they were very comfortable talking in front of me because I'm one of the few guys that worked my way, way and I wasn't born into that, you know, and uh, it's just, you know, I just learned early on that everybody had their price and, and the political corruption is rampant and the FBI's got a good case to justify their existence for this, but they call cases like mine collateral damage. So, you don't have to be guilty of anything, Scott. They can they can manufacture, orchestrate, manipulate. They can create a very brand new charge, which my case had no precedent. I went to a fucking federal prison. When they say one year, it actually cost me six years on my life and about a million dollars because they couldn't get a forfeiture or a seizure or anything on my property. Well, they, they put you in... in federal prison in Milan, Michigan, yeah. which was lucky for you. It's not that far from Detroit, but it's a, it's a, a serious place with serious people. Yes. Uh, a lot of uh, mobsters, uh, mob shot callers, uh, biker bosses, drug kingpins are put in Milan. Yeah. Well, they have, they have them all separated now. So the, most of the mobsters are gone. And I think gone. my point though, Paul, just so the, so the pub, so the audience understands you, you didn't go to a club fed. No, that you didn't go club. to some low. You know, I was listening. Here's the drug dealer that you were, I you were in a you were in the to buying drugs from. He went down to fucking uh, Morgantown to, yeah. where they don't have any fences. It's a camp. I was supposed to go there, but I ended up in a prison. Right. You know, it's a serious prison. You know, right. and um, this is what the federal government can do to you. You know, if you do not cooperate with them, I just chose to sit on my Fifth Amendment rights, and I thought that the truth would set me free. Uh, but in, you know, in an existential sense, it did <laughs> because I got rid of all the garbage. Well, Paul, let's just go back. You know, you, you grew up uh, in Detroit, uh, went to Pepperdine Law School. Um, yes, I grew up in the east side of Detroit from very low income family and all that. And we were just taught at, you know, at the people on the other side of the tracks go to college. We don't go to college, you know. Uh, I understand you're a lawyer too. I, I didn't know that. Well, I went to I went to law school and I got a degree. I don't practice. Right, right. I don't either. Yes, I'm a, I'm a, J, <laughs> I'm I'm a, a JD. You don't <laughs> practice anymore. I never I'm practice happy to brag person. about the fact but, that I'm not a lawyer. For people that might not know about Pepperdine, that's in Malibu, California. Yes, uh, Pepperdine that, is. You're, li you're literally going to school in a postcard. I mean, it's the most gorgeous oh, campus the, I've ever seen in my life. You're on a mountain the overlooking Earth. the Pacific Ocean. To put it in perspective, Scott, Pepperdine is, in fact, the third most expensive law school in the United States behind Harvard and Stanford. Okay. Now they changed the name to Caruso Law School because Mr. Caruso donated $40 million to Pepperdine to change the name. So his kid could get in. Apparently, and that's the way it works. It's a big money school. You know, matter of fact, when they we would see movie stars around, you know, being in Malibu and all that, and the Pepperdine students kind of look down on the movie stars because they don't have as much money as the students. Right. I mean, in our parking lot, they, you know, the Mercedes, there's a Porsches, there's a Lamborghini. I didn't even have a fucking car, man. I didn't have a bicycle over there. I grew up in the mountains, you know. It's it's literally it's so breathtaking. So, I'm not someone who gets choked I mean, up by nature. But when I was in Malibu driving on Pacific Coast Highway and you can't and help but miss it. I it's mean, just you, the most beautiful, picturesque uh setting you could ever imagine. Oh yes, absolutely, man. I mean just weather that I mean everything about it, but law school's hard. I you know, see I went I went to college only because I was a victim of police brutality at 19 years old, and I just couldn't understand how this happens in the United States of America. And it's very common over in Cook County, in the L.A. County, you know, and it's pretty common here in Detroit area. 
you know, at the time it was. Anyway, I mean, to put things in perspective, they they beat on this uh, Rodney King for like I don't know, 12, 17 minutes. You know, Malice we had our, we had our um, are you gonna talk? We had our own Rodney King in Detroit, Malice Green. Malice Green for like five minutes before they killed him because yeah. he wouldn't show him his license. Uh, you know, and, and then this Tyrell Nichols for a few minutes before they killed him. George Floyd for eleven minutes. They, I have it recorded from witness statements and everything that they beat on me while handcuffed for two hours. You know, they pistol whipped me, uh, opened my head up, stitching the whole thing, broke my wrists. You know, they kneel on the handcuffs so your wrist break. You know, uh, the whole thing. And I mean, and I had a, I had a witness came forward about a year later after we filed, uh, we were filing a lawsuit. So that's how I ended up going to Michigan State, and I was like. I just wanted to be educated. I didn't understand how they can get away with it and cover it up. And uh, interestingly, in my case, in that police brutality suit, they they had you know phone calls. This lady's calling the police department. Hey, they're they're pistol whipping a guy on my uh, on my front lawn. You know, and uh, and then they hang up on her. And then she calls back again, and she calls back again. She had it all recorded because she had a digital clock. You know. Called at 1201, 1220, 1235. Now they're pistol whipping him. You know, they're killing this man. Well, he stole a car. He tried to escape from the police. This and that. And, you know, mind your own fucking business, that kind of shit. Well, you know, this lady was just afraid to come out of her house. That's all. But we found her about a year later by com complete, uh, I don't know, happenstance, I guess is the word. She was at a Detroit Tiger game talking about, you know, what she witnessed. And my aunt was standing, sitting behind her. She tapped on her shoulder. Yeah, I lived right down the street. We found a witness. She said the exact same thing I said. And then they, the police claimed that there was an electrical power outage from 12 o'clock till 3 in the morning when all this happened. So, therefore, there were no tapes. There was no <laughs> evidence. They just covered the whole thing up. And I got some money from it. So, I went to college, you know. You know, what, what, after after college, after Michigan State, I was, you know, broke. Uh, my parents didn't, they would have gave me the money to go to college. They just had limited resources, you know. And so I got a scholarship to go to Pepperdine, which was pretty bizarre to me. I don't know how, I mean, it just happened. And uh, here I am going to Malibu. I'm just from the, a kid from the east side of Detroit, man. And I was like, wow, I'm in law school, man. <laughs> it's cool. I don't have to work. You know, you know the feeling, right? <laughs> But just to give people uh, just some quick, you know, slice of knowledge from the Detroit underworld that we just referenced, the, the Rodney King thing happened in April of 1992. Uh, Paulie's situation, I'm sure, happened in the early 80s. Uh, mine happened in 1980. Yeah. Okay, so early 80s. The Rodney King situation in LA was April 92. In Detroit, we had our own version of of Rodney King, which was Malice Green, Malice Green. which yeah. was only six months after Rodney King. Right. I went, uh, listen, Scott, Scotty, I went to one of my first fundraisers I went to was uh, Butson and Nevers. The two right. The, 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 so people know the difference was Rodney King wasn't killed. Malice Green was murdered. Murdered by these two cops. And, and these Butson this, and, uh, this and cop Nevers. And they, yeah. I went to a fundraiser for, for Butson. Okay. I didn't know it at the time. I thought it had something to do with the courts. When I get in there, I'm, I'm donating two hundred dollars to these two cops that killed this fucker, and I'm yep. like, "What the?" F so I went in the kitchen and I pulled my car in the back and I unloaded the cases of liquor they had for the, all these cops were in there, and I just took off. I wanted my. You can imagine how bad I wanted my two hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paulie, what year did you come back to Detroit and, and get uh, into the bar here? Um, it took me a little while to get in the bar. Yeah, it was like 87, 88. I passed the bar in eighty eight. I graduated eighty six. Okay, so but I was in California and I was partying a little bit, so I stayed out there a little longer. My last student loan came in late, and so I was lighting it up, you know. Uh, At what point did you meet Frank the Bomb and uh, Mr. Vito Jack? Frank the Bomb, I was best friends with Sam Scarcelli, who was best friends with the Bomb. The Bomb, the bomb was all well, I seen him as a kid when I was younger, teenager, when I used to go to Mr. Paul's Chop House, have the mm -hmm. whole entourage, the whole thing, but I uh. Became friends with them right around that time, right around, I'd say like 89, right around there, right before 90. And uh, and I was taking the bar exam at the time, and uh, I met him it, up at the lake. We were partying, and, and he says, hey, man, is this our new lawyer, man? He says, this guy's all fucked up. 
<laughs> what, what the fuck? He says, well, you know, he says he's a good guy, you know, he's one of us, this kind of thing. And, and my uncles happened to work for some of the Detroit mobsters and all that other stuff. So, you know, I had some credibility and this and that. But we just hit it off from, like, the very first day. Well, for, and, for, like, I would say that I spent more time with him than any other person in the last 40 years. I, I have I have really, really positive feelings uh, towards Frank the Bomb. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, what, it is what it is. He was it not, is, he was, he was a gangster to the core. It was in his DNA. He was a criminal, uh, every, every cell of his being, but uh, he was very good to me. You know, never, so never, never, never put his hand in my pocket. Never tried to put his guy. hand in my pocket. To me, okay, you got to understand, in my world, these guys, when I was with these guys, they were the most honorable people that I knew. Because, you know, I did criminal defense work, so you know a lot of criminals. And most of them are just guys that drink too much or do too many drugs and they screw up. And and then I knew some people in law enforcement that weren't flying straight, you know. <laughs> and then you meet the real criminals, the judges and prosecutors. Yeah. And, oh, my Lord. Government's it doesn't the even real hold law. a candle to the that. organized crime. It, does, it doesn't. And these guys... They protected me more than to try to draw me in. Now, there's some factions in the Detroit mob that try to draw me into this or that, but I was always protected by these guys because, you know, uh, Jack Toko, he liked me. I don't know why. I didn't even know him that good. You know, and he covered for me. And, you know, I was always getting in trouble. So, <laughs> you know, it's no secret. But um, I got along really good. And Frankie the Bomb was just a good, honorable guy. You know what I mean? In that uh, world, in that world, he was in that world. Yes, uh, in that his world, just was like, his bond and look, man. So when I get to prison, one of the first guys that was waiting to meet me was uh, uh, Randy Yeager, Matt. You know, from the Outlaw Motorcycle Club. He's the president who got Taco in there for the yeah. international president. In so Detroit. the bomb, just yeah, I, Paul. Just so you know, our audience is uh, it's it's very widespread. So I always like to let people know, you know. I, you can't assume that they know everybody in Detroit. Oh yeah, right, right. I get so it. So let's. So Jack Toko was a longtime Godfather. Right. Yeah, Detroit they wouldn't Mafia. know. Yeah, right. Oh, uh, I Frank the Bomb Bomberito, who we who who we're talking about here, was a um. A you know, we, talk, we talk about OGs on on the podcast. Yeah. He is the OG of all OGs. The, right. Without question, the most colorful character. Well, if you YouTube it, Taco comes up as America's number Mafia. one gangster. If yeah. you YouTube it, and, and the, Taco was the international president of the Outlaws. Right. And um, you know his right hand man was Randy Yeager. So and the fun. bomb, just so that people know, the bomb was the Detroit mob's liaison to the bikers and the yes. outlaws that yes. we're talking about now. Taco Bowman was the the the, the outlaws' godfather for a long time. Was right. based in Detroit, and then Randy Yeager, who um, Paul's talking about, who we met in jail, was Taco, one of Taco's right hand men, and and ran all of the outlaw activities. Hey man, I gotta correct you. They ain't jail, man. It's fucking prison. Prison, sorry. <laughs> Jail's uh, a year. <laughs> and Randy Yeager ran all the stuff in I don't North, mean to laugh North, uh, Northwest Indiana. Yeah, he's responsible for the largest bombing in American history outside of Oklahoma and New York City. Yeah, where he bombed that whole Chicago city block, but nobody died. But he pled guilty to five murders. And a, a one man Rico and all that, and he's getting out in 2025. Yeah, I just got a letter from him. I can't show it to you, but well, yeah. but, but I think the point is that your relationship with Frank Bomarito, and at this point, when you're going away, it, Frank was dead. Yes. But so I still had friends of friends, right? I, so it just it shows that it the it it who you know can sometimes oh, help you even yeah, after that, that person's I mean, gone. Total. I mean, you get total prison respect because I didn't recoup. Scott, put this in perspective, man. Everyone that gets targeted by the FBI, yeah. save one in a, about a million. I know, they got a 99.9% conviction. 99.999% flip rate when you're a lawyer over 50. <laughs> you could just look it up and Google it, man. Everyone cooperates. I chose not to, facing 105 years. Then that got dismissed and they re-indicted me, and I didn't even know what the fuck it was. Hosting a house party, you know, where some people got high. I didn't know I was responsible for someone else's actions, but it's not a party until someone gets high. <laughs> so, I so wear tell that me, as a badge of honor. So tell you people, know. like, it's the late 80s. 
uh, at this point, Billy Jack Ohlone, who was Frank's kind of rabbi in the mafia, Billy uh-huh. Jack was uh, one of the street bosses of the Detroit mob, him and his brother, uh, Tony Jack, they ran the streets for half se- over a half century. Yeah. Um, and Billy was more of the good cop and Tony Jack was more of the bad cop. And that and playing in that role of being the good cop and being more of a jovial, uh, you know, uh, good time Charlie type with being Billy, he gravitated towards Frank the Bomb, who's oh, he loved they, they were so unconventional. The Bomb uh, did a five year bit for him, right? But the Bomb and, and Billy were inseparable. And uh, I remember there, you know, there would uh, I saw something in a wiretap once where Billy was getting. I think I forgot who it was, but he was talking to somebody who was complaining about Frank, and he's like, "What you're saying might be true, but it doesn't matter. He's my guy." Yeah. Oh <laughs> and no, that's, he might that's be a fact. he might be a son of a bitch, but he's my son I of a bitch. I think that's the reason that he magnetized towards me is because when I first met him, I was a little fucking you know I was partying a little bit. I I didn't recognize him. I was sitting with him at the table, man, and I go, "Hey, man, I go, you wouldn't know it by the degenerate crowd that's here tonight, but it's a big deal because the old man's coming here." And they're not supposed to be in the same room with him and Frankie the Bomb. The boss is coming. And he goes, is that right? He says, let me tell you this story. My brother Tony says, why do you hang around with this one guy? He says, I take him all over the fucking world. He's a dirty, nasty, no good motherfucker, but I like him. He <laughs> said, she said, so I'm starting to like you. Does that make you a fucking degenerate? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> who is this old man? You know, <laughs> it's fucking Billy Jack. You know? <laughs> the guy who whacked off him, by the way. Allegedly. I mean, Allegedly. why does my brother come out and say <laughs> Why doesn't anybody ever come out and say it? The guy who well, I mean, I've said it. I, I think that the I'm, get your, I'm interested to get your opinion on this. Uh, coming from a, a guy that was, you know, immersed with a lot of the top suspects in the Hoffa case for much of your career and represented some of those guys. Uh, why do you think that in the overall narrative, in terms of American uh, mythology, pop culture, what you see on television, what you see in the movies? Why do you think Detroit always gets um, marginalized okay. in a in an assassination in a murder that they were a hundred percent in control in? But if you watch The Irishman or you watch other adaptations, right. it looks like we were just See, you know, Detroit, Detroit were, side, were side players. Detroit being known as one of the most violent cities in America, everybody knows that, you know. But Detroit was like the nonviolent mob. They were right. whacking people like they were in Philadelphia, in New York, in Miami, in LA. They weren't doing that. It was a weapon of last it was resort. A very high profit market yeah. uh, because gambling was so big in Detroit and Chicago, you know, sports book. That's it was the biggest in America here. And up until then, and now that drew national attention, but they didn't have the technology to the DNA and all that other stuff to connect that all that up. And uh, my understanding was they they didn't mind Hoffa. They kind of liked them. And well, Billy and Tony order, liked them. They socialized with them for 30 years. Yeah. But they're never going to find a body. When they start just digging up every couple of years, they're going to find – they're never going to find that body because <laughs> it doesn't exist. And I used to – fuck. listen, it was taboo to sit at the table, you know, when you're at the closed meetings and stuff, never bring up Hoffa. You can't say the name. But I did it all the time because the old man got a kick out of me. And I go, hey, man. I go, hey, Mr. G, what the fuck, man? Tell me what you did with Hoffa. Script it out, man. I'll write the shortest book of all time. He goes, what's the other shortest book? I said, the great Scott, chefs of Scotland. Fuck it, man. I'll write a one-page thing, man. Just show me where diagram this fucking thing. Him, <laughs> he just Frank and laughing. Billy. Frank oh, and Billy. Jack will start cracking up. <laughs> And then he switched to talking. It took this woman. I'm serious. He didn't know that I didn't speak fluent Italian. And I don't. I just, I'm just half Italian. I don't, I don't know. And they switched to Italian. And he looked at me and I was like, Nancy Prior, get beyond the to the band. You know, like everything's okay. Don't worry about it. I got, you know. And, and I don't even speak Italian. It took him like five years to catch on. And the bomb knew I did. He just left. He was, that was funny, amusing. You know, I was told that the bomb and Billy used to refer to, the Hoffa case is the secret recipe. Yeah, never, yeah well, they're yeah. never going to find the secret recipe. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. You, you see, hey, he, how did he say hey, they ain't going to find nobody because there ain't nobody? Yeah. You know. <laughs> oh, Scotty, can I tell your viewers this? They might get a kick out of it. When I met Scotty, uh, I was asked, uh, there were three mob bosses there, two captains, a couple associates. We were at Luciano's, you know, talking. And this thing was a. a so they come to me, Paulie, man, you got to do your job. You're the concierge. You know? You're the concierge if it gets you paid or if it gets you laid. 
Okay, 30 years ago it meant something. It don't mean nothing nowadays. But anyway, this Bernstein thing. We got a I said, Bernstein. I said, how do I know that name? That guy, the journalist that's coming around. <laughs> yeah. He said, well, he's coming to parties. He's interviewing people. He's got a camera and shit. I said, oh, yeah, but he ain't filming nothing. It's just a fucking photo. No, no, it's a real camera. He's filming people. We got to know. I, I said, so what do you want me to do? They said, well, we want you to, you know, want to see what's going on. Can you, you know, you can get along with anybody. I said, well, yeah, man, I'll, I'll do you one better. I'll take him down to New Orleans. And, you know, maybe open yeah, just, up. Just so people stuff. understand, there was another bit. Just so doesn't. There was a business opportunity for all of us out in New Orleans. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, that, and, that, Paul, and I, they knew that I was going out there with another partner. Right. Of mine. Yeah. There was nothing and, illegal or nothing. Right. Minister and, about and anything. I was just told to ask. Well, right. So Paul is is. I kind of knew. I, I had an idea that Paul was there to watch me. I said to the guy. I remember telling this one boss on uh, the mob in Detroit. I said, well, "What was he want me to do?" He said, "Well, get him drinking. Get him to open up." I said, "I don't even think that guy drinks. I, I've seen him around. It. He doesn't. He's a teetotaler to me. But whatever." I, he says. Well, some ammunition, this and that. He, I said, what do you want me to do, slip him a Mickey? And he said, well, that's not a bad idea. I go, hey, man, I ain't doing all that. I, I fucking asked the I guy there whatever. Was a, there was a, so I knew um, when I got down to New Orleans, I remember you calling me about 7 o'clock. So we just got in the room. We're going to take a nap. I go, take a nap in New Orleans? <laughs> Fuck, are we on the same page here, buddy? Was, uh, no, man, we're going to party, man. Let's go. And I kind of forgot my, what my job was to do down there until I got a call from this guy. Hey, what, what's uh, what's up with Bernstein? I'm like, oh, I gotta get back to you. I forgot to ask the guy. You know, we just had a good time down there, right? Remember when L left his camera on the, on the river? Yeah, and then yeah, we, we almost met. We were all going back on the same flight. I remember we we almost it was, we had, it was oh, a we wild a night time. the night before that, and then we almost oh, missed. Yeah, I just back reported to back to him. Uh, hey, uh, but, the guy's a journalist. He's educated, and you know he's just doing his job. I that's the way I saw it. And uh, you know, I think there was a. Um, People are scared or intimidated by what by what, what they don't know. And nobody knew who I was. Scott, I, I you wasn't know. Italian. I wasn't an East Side. Right. And he's Jewish, too, on top of it. Right. And, I jump, and, you know, and out of the, on a, kind of out of nowhere, I pop up in the late 2000s. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. And the everybody Jewish was kind of like, who is this thing? guy? They had this big conspiracy theory yeah. and all this bullshit. You know, I said, the guy's just doing his job, I think. I don't think he's got any ulterior motives other than he's going to probably be somebody someday. I don't know. So the he's first a journalist. Time I, first time I met Paul, uh, I want to say I put out my Detroit Mob Confidential documentary in 09 or it was either 09 or 10. And I got a message from the bomb who I had over the previous, let's say, three years had written about. He was in the doc. He was in the book. Uh, and someone told me, "Hey, the the bomb wants to meet you." Um, and I was, I'll always, I'll meet anybody. I'm, I'm not someone who hides behind my uh, computer screen. I'm someone who who believes in. Yeah, I always respected that. Right, yeah. and, and uh, so I I went, and I made sure I you know took the proper precautions, and uh, I went, and that was the first time I met him, and I met Paul, I believe at at that event. It was at East uh, East Side Manor. Yeah, where, that, at Eastport. Yeah. He used to uh, hold like a Tuesday night spaghetti night. Um, they do the fucking karaoke. Drove me nuts, man. Yeah. All the dagos, are, oh, excuse me, I can't say it. All the Italian guys in there would sing like Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra, and all the bikers would be Johnny Cash. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, and Frank yeah. would get up and do his uh, you know, he, his Frank, Frank Sinatra, uh, you know, put my way. And then he'd yeah. do his other, ra- he'd, uh, he'd get up and he'd rap. Um, yeah. Yeah, so so I met him at, so around let's say I met him in 2009 2010 he was still uh you know standoffish with me to a degree and, and guarded and I don't blame him he was a you know kind of an active he still was an active member of of the Detroit mob at that point at some point a couple years later after Billy Jackaloni died uh Frank kind of went independent um was was kind of blocked. Yeah, Frank had no problem talking about anything that was on public record. So, so at that so at that point man, the man had 26 years in prison. Okay. Yeah. Now the modern federal prison system is dramatically different than the old federal prison system. But Frank did, Frank, it's 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 it's, uh, it's horrible in there. Uh, the conditions I mean to give you a perspective in the one unit I lived in 
The doors are metal and they're so warped that not one door can close. So you can't have a lockdown. They're just all running around screaming and yelling till four in the morning. Every, there's no let up every fucking day. Right? It's a horrible place, man. But really for, the, for the bomb, for, for a guy that, uh, let's say, uh, up until he was 60, had done a lot of prison time. Um, let's say between, let's say, his ages of 20 and 60. Yeah, but see, he, he didn't do any time. He, he didn't do any time his last 25 years on Earth. And so. see, they were doing shorter sentences. They were getting yeah. attempts on a, a solicitation of murder, 20 years. But they would plead to an attempt that's just five years. And then they used to have parole so they could get out early. And there's no more parole in the federal system. You can't. There's no early releases. You know? and when the bomb beat his last case, the last case the bomb took, well, last big case he took was the Warren... Um, the, the bombing, the bombings yeah. of the trash companies, right? And then John Pree. But you uh, didn't know that I actually, I actually represented him on his last case in right, the which, city of Mount Clemens, where he was charged with an assault charge, assault and battery. He was sixty six or sixty eight at the time, and I asked him, I said, "Frankie, I will get rid of this case." But they love the, these gangsters love to talk in court. They're very comfortable talking in court because they're always in fucking court. You know, probably yeah. more than me. But anyway, so I said, please don't say nothing. I'm going to get rid of this case. And the judge looks at the file, and she doesn't have the – there's sometimes on the lien check, if there's more federal, they won't have the record, you know, unless they have to look actively look for it. And she knows – everybody in Detroit area knows who he is, you know. So, so just, where's his criminal history? I said – and the bomb, I said, don't talk. And he said, what do you mean? You mean I hit somebody? He said, no, nah, I ain't hit nobody in 20 years. I shoot motherfuckers, but I ain't hit nobody in 20 years. And it's on a fucking a court record, you know. Everybody's in the course looking. I'm like, come on, Frank, come on, man. You know. <laughs> the <laughs> first time I saw <laughs> the bomb, I didn't meet him at this point, was at uh, Jackie Jackaloni, who's Billy Jack's son, the alleged current uh, mob boss of the Detroit family, went on trial for a RICO. We talk about 99 99- Point nine percent conviction rate for the feds. He well, beat the case in Oklahoma. Well, he had an indictment set aside. Yeah, so. but so, but I want to just play on the story you just told. So yeah. I'm in the gallery, and they probably didn't recognize me at this point. And I could hear uh, it was the first time I was ever face to face with with all these guys because uh, Jackie, Frankie, and Billy Jack were all in court, and I could hear Billy say to Frank. Um. Uh, wait, I'm trying to think what the yeah I can I can hear Billy say to Frank when the verdict comes in, please be quiet, <laughs> like don't don't make a scene, and the verdict comes in and it's not guilty and the bomb. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, uh, the, Jesus the, the great jury the system thing, yeah. of, the, of the American justice system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he just starts starts uh, doing a victory lap in court. He was, you know, and he did. In fact, I hate to be stereotypical, but he looked like every gangster that's been in every movie yeah. since the twenties. Okay, right. didn't he? He was very it's, unapologetic. You know, who he, he was. He, he, if you just looked at him, he looked like yeah. wow. You know, if you passed you on the street, you go wow. Is that guy? Like, and he was just a stick. Or... He was just a stick up kid. He wasn't a guy that was really born into the mob, even though he had some cousins. Uh, but you know, he he was a stick up kid that uh, made his name robbing people. And uh, one day he, he robs a, a, a either a game. Uh, it was Carl Chop House downtown. But I thought that was after. The Carl's uh, I, don't, I don't know. He got caught. He robs uh, some place that was connected to Billy Jack alone. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Okay. And then Jack and Billy called That's him right. to I a would meeting. Thought not to talk about that kind of shit. So I think that was like sixty-seven or sixty-eight. The Carl's Chop House thing was, I think, sixty-nine. Yeah. yeah. When Frank famously went in and we got him a plaque for his birthday. Arm robbery at and proprietor of Carl's Chop House for twenty minutes. We Which was a very back. popular steakhouse. <laughs> uh, was one of the Jackaloni's favorite spots. Yes. Um, yes. I used to go there when I was a young kid with my grandparents because they. You know Jackaloni, man. You know he had that prosthetic uh, leg on his yeah. right knee from the knee down. It was prosthesis, right? Right. He lost his when leg. I when broke he was a my kid. leg uh, for the eighth time or whatever, and I was in track. They he have a car pick me up. We'd have coffee like three or four times a week over there in Clinton Township. And he would he'd take his leg off. He'd go, hey, Polly, man, I'm on my last leg over here. And he started hitting me with the leg and shit. It was like, 
And uh, you know, my kid, one time, my son comes and sees me at the coffee shop with him or outside. He's like, Dad, is that like he, Vito Giacalone, the guy that's on the news? And I go, yeah. And I go, hey, Mr. G, this is my son. He said, go get a bottle of Dago Red from the car, you know. So they give my son a bottle of wine. My son's like, oh, my God, I'm going to keep this. I'm going to frame it. I'm never going to drink this. And like a week later, I went to his apartment. And, you know, it's in the garbage. <laughs> yeah, I've never goes. heard anyone say a negative thing about Billy Jack alone. Oh, this man could talk among paupers and princes. It's, you know, any level of society he was very comfortable with and very well read. I mean, he was a good guy. I don't I know him as a good guy. Maybe they did some bad things in the regular world, but not in their world. You know what I mean? It's kind of hard to explain. They were very um, – it wasn't just a Detroit thing with them. I mean, they, Billy and Tony uh, could go to any city in America, and they'd roll out the red carpet for now, them. Now, when I was in Milan, I wanted to meet the guy that ran the joint. Now, Milan's about the fifth largest prison in the United States. You know, they got about 16, 1,700 people. And I said, who runs this joint? And they said, well, it's Big Mo from Chicago. So I said, well, I want to get my currency through him. But I already got credibility, so he'll front me the money so I can buy stuff. You know, for, you know, they just can't get in the commissary and the currency stamps. So I go to meet Big Mo, and he's like, "Hey, man, Big Mo wasn't much on conversation, but he's like, you know, I uh, uh, heard you connected you to gangster lawyer." And I'm like, "Well, I used to be, I guess." And he's like, "Well, he says, you know, Mr. Tony Jacaloni, I was in Florence, Colorado with him. You know, he's a good dude, man. He said, but he'd be fucking with them guys nonstop." I'm like, uh, yeah, I didn't really know Tony. He's been in prison. Mean, I think he was in prison before I turned 18. I don't know. <laughs> you know been in prison a long time. So that's all well, I Tony, know. <laughs> Tony actually didn't do, when you, when you uh, you know, go kind of go pound for pound, Tony did some time when he was younger. But as a wise guy, as like a, as the, you know, the street boss, he only did that one kind of, that one seven-year sentence uh, between 79 and 86 he he did some I think some shorter things maybe in the sixties but Billy did more Billy did more time than Tony did. Oh, I I'm unaware of that. I didn't think Billy did that much time. I think he got a well. Billy did a Billy did a bunch of like three little, four year bit like three yeah, four year bit. And the last time they got a, he got a year, but you got to no, understand the last the, la, the la, Billy did six years on on the uh, the game tax case, which was the big Rico that came down against all the leaders of the Detroit mob in '96. Frank the Bomb and Jackie Jackaloni. We're not indicted in that. Case. Right. But you know the funny thing about <laughs> that they call the gang that couldn't shoot straight because they were taxing people on the street. So, in other words, we had a bar on Seven Mile and Gratiot, and, you know, bars, you know, you have gambling operations, all that, and they come to you and they want you to pay a street tax. Most people just voluntarily give it up. You know, they want about 800 to 1,000 a month if you're taking any action in there. And, like, we just tell them, go well, fuck yourself again. You you know, it's a different day and age. And but most people were giving it up voluntarily. That's what they got pinched for. That's not a very high profit scheme. No, it was all shakedowns. They didn't have any murders uh, right. in that indictment. Exactly. It was, it was, it were 30 year shakedowns and, and illegal. And they all, and they're now in the modern day, everybody cooperates too. The Quran, uh, you know, I don't want to say name, whatever, you know, the guys involved, whatever, but everybody yeah. cooperates. Yeah. You know, well, so you have you have a situation where Detroit is actually a an outlier in the sense that they have not had a lot of cooperators. They have not had uh, a lot of guys die in prison or or die in the streets. Well, absolutely, the most you're part, right. And you know you got to understand Detroit is the pipeline to Canada. Yeah, all the narcotics that were coming through from you know come through uh, Montreal or Toronto. They come in the pathways of, you know, St. Clair County or Detroit. And that's where the outlaw clubhouse, the very small bastion of the outlaws, but it's a pipeline to Canada. And they work hand in hand with the Detroit. Well, they call it mafia. I don't, I never said that word. It's the, the, the outfit. I don't know. Yeah. Mafia. Detroit, people don't know that, that like, you know, Chicago, they call it the outfit. It's more of an understood term in yeah. Detroit, the newspapers and the media, call it the Detroit mob or the partnership right. or the combination. Yeah, I had a but, connection to the New Orleans mafia or outfit. That's the birthplace of the mob, by the right. way, historically. In America, in the, eight, in the 1800s. But yeah, in, 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 in Detroit, now, uh, they call it the outfit as well. I didn't the, have a connection to any Detroit guys. I was, I had to, instead of going and getting in trouble for some of my antics, I did a rehab stint down there in Mississippi. And one of the Traficantes 
that was related to him as a grandson or whatever, maybe by marriage, it doesn't matter. And that's how I met that guy. And I met some guys from New Orleans. So they knew some guys from Detroit after that. And I would go, you know, I mean, I didn't pull you into that world when we were down there, but you know. No, we didn't meet. I didn't. We didn't meet with any wise guys down there. I, mean, I don't think Prophet were down there for a. I don't think thing. it ever came you, up. You and you and your boy, uh, one of your yeah, boys, right. Brian, were down there for something different, and we ended up hanging out. Right. Uh, yeah, it never came up. I didn't know you were doing a gig. We definitely did not run into. I would have any... taken you there, man. I mean, I would have loved to. No, don't. You know, I'm don't not know, saying man. it like I would have been opposed to it. If oh, you no, would have said, I mean, "Hey, I got some uh, some Marcello Prime Family Soldiers introduce you to," I would have. It's gotten down. In case you didn't notice, I was kind of busy anyway. <laughs> right. And um, so, so talk a little bit about um working with the bikers that you met through. Uh, the Japanese you know, and, and this is funny, man. I gotta tell you this. I gotta tell you this. this one now, guy, I shouldn't say working with, but like representing them. Well, okay, I'll just tell you about it. When not this lawyer tried to rip me off on a referral fee, now you know, all lawyers we get one third of anything you refer to another lawyer. And uh, this guy, I, I understood that he got 120,000 cash. And uh, I called the lawyer up and I says, Hey, man, you sent me 5,000. You know, that means you owe me 40,000. That's cash off the top. We pay referrals off the top because the longer the money stays in your pocket, the more it becomes yours. So you just do the right thing. And he said, no, I will pay you when I, I will amortize these payments in 1099. You and all this other lawyer talk. I said, what, what the fuck are you talking about? He says, I'm the biker lawyer here in Detroit. I represent all the bikers. And he said, and fuck you or who you know, or who you think, you know, I will pay you when I feel like paying you over the next two years. And I said, well, you know, I said, you know what? That movie, The Lincoln Lawyer, you know, the part where the, the bikers chase the lawyer down yeah, to pay down him? The car, yeah. that, that doesn't happen in the real world. As a matter of fact, they hardly ever pay. We do favor for favor type things. And I said, well, then, okay. I called Frankie the bomb, him, and a few biker types went over to the office, and the lawyer paid me within the hour. In the bag, and I taxed his ass for that too, man. You know, <laughs> so I guess who I thought I know was pretty cool. Right? Did you get? Did but, you spend time with Taco? I I know I've met him a few times. Yeah. What was it? What was he like? What was Taco Bowman like? They say he had a look that could kill you with his eyes. Well, I, I'm going to tell you one of the first times I met him. I said I called him Harold, which is a no-no in that world. His name was Harry Taco Bowman. Right. right, but you can't call him Harry or Harold. Right, right. No, no. And I, I, I just like to fuck with people once in a while. So I go, hey, Harold, you want to hear a good one? And he just fucking stared at me like, man, he's kind of pissed off. I said, yeah, the guy came to my office the other day. He wants to sue you because he lived in Gross Point. And the guy cut his lawn for like two years and Taco wouldn't pay him. So I go, yeah, man, he wants to sue you, man, for uh, non-payment of fees. And he goes, well, how's that lawsuit going? I go, Pretty fucked up. I think I lost it or I was negligent or something. And he started cracking up as a sociopathic, you know, by nature. But he, like, so I went with him pretty good. You said you, he, you mentioned that he lived in Gross Point. We talked yeah. about him on an episode uh, earlier this fall. We did a whole kind of life and we call it life and crimes of Taco oh. Bowman. And he moved into Gross Point where all of the the big uh, wise guys were, where all the uh, capos yeah. and, and mob bosses well, were. He's from Marysville. It's a small, it's the it's closest yeah. thing to Mayberry RFD that I've ever seen because that's where I live right now. I moved it's to up, Marysville. It's up in the sticks. It's, it's a yeah, good I, uh, it's 45 funny, minutes yeah. from Detroit. Well, here's the funny part, man. The feds, they've got these tactics to break you, to, I mean, just bleed them till you bleed them, that kind of stuff. I mean, here I moved to Marysville. It's two hours away from downtown Detroit. It's two the hours. Port, it's two hours. I just said forty-five minutes. It's two hours. No, no, it's about an hour and a half to two hours. In the winter, it's two hours. Two hours. I didn't realize how bad it was. How far away? Now the the Eastern District of Michigan, the court is five minutes from my house. That's where the my court, court is. Court here on court. Yes, it's five okay. minutes from my house. Okay. The, the the feds would make me. They would call me to go downtown to drug tests and alcohol tests. Sometimes three times a week. 10 times a month. My court order said three times a month. But they were constantly doing this to harass you and roust you and the whole thing. And they would call. I get a phone call. You got to be downtown. The marshals are going to pick you up and blah, blah, blah. Man, you just got to pack it up. You got to go. It's an all day affair. And I bring it up in front of the judge. And the judge says, well, you know, 
I can't believe our we don't have the sophistication to test him here. But that's all that set was said. And they still made me go downtown. Constantly. This happened for two and a half years. Did you did you ever have to take uh Frank the bomb to the uh, Fed's office in, in downtown Detroit? No. No, you no, were just, uh, no. You were just handling the Macomb County stuff. Uh I mean I was at his house when the feds came to see him. Uh they were looking for Taco right. when he was on the run. I was at his house, yeah. And I was, fuck, I didn't want to talk to no FBI guys, man. He was just like he was laughing about it. You know? Yeah. He said, Oh, he told the FBI guy, Yeah, I just seen Taco. He just hopped <laughs> the fence in the back. He was with Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> he right. told the FBI guys and they started laughing and they laughed. You know? That was about the extent of it. You know? But well, when, well, the, when the FBI comes, hey, by the way, when the FBI comes to see me the very first time, Scott. The very first time, you know, nine agents don't come to your house unless something's up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when I said, hey, man, you know, this guy you're talking about, this drug dealer, he got popped by the DEA. Where are you guys from? And they all flipped their cards to all FBI. So I already knew it was nothing to do with drugs. They wanted information on judicial bribery, yeah. political corruption, and delivery of mob money for political influence. That's what they wanted. So uh, they go on and I see your phone. So they start going through my phone. It's not every person, probably close to never, that's got a bunch of mob bosses, narcotics, undercover cops, a bunch of criminals, you know, with well-known names and stuff like that. And when they got to, they got to Scott Bernstein, they got, you know, I had your number on my phone. Sorry about that. But anyway, they said, Bernstein, is that the Scott Bernstein? And I said, yeah, the author guy. And they said, yeah, well, we don't want his number. We definitely don't want his number. And they just start laughing. So I didn't, I was thinking, what the fuck? Is this Bernstein an FBI guy or something? <laughs> yeah, let's be very clear that there are some I, people I know. that somehow believe that I'm like a uh, an arm, like a media arm of yeah. the federal government when that couldn't be further from the truth. Well, I mean, what are you supposed to think when you're, you're surrounded by FBI agents in your house? You know, yeah. That's never happened. I'm just saying, I feel like when anybody actually meets me, any of the people that I write about, when they finally, if, if, it, it, you know, uh, for both of our sakes, we get to kind of uh, have a meeting of the minds. I think they right. all come away with the knowledge that that is, again, the furthest thing from the truth. I will take a wise guy's word for what they're telling me. Um, a lot of times I'll take it over what the feds are taking or telling yeah. me. I'm not a, I'm not, I, I make my own decisions. I'm objective. I, just, I know it's being shaded on both sides. Scotty, I used to be a big fan of the FBI because I witnessed so much criminal activity amongst judges prosecutors and law enforcement. I witnessed so much of this stuff that to me, I thought, wow, the FBI, you know, they're there to clean this stuff up. I didn't know how rogue they were. They're becoming a fourth branch of government without any checks and balances. The only check and balance they have is the attorney general who rubber stamps whatever they do. So they've just become, uh, I mean, they're, they're unlimited funding and they have nothing but time. And anything that's in their path, they will destroy if you don't give them information. It's uh, listen. They hired one thousand over a thousand Gestapo agents after the World War II. They brought them here to America to set up the FBI playbook. <laughs> the only difference is they don't beat you with, you know, pistol whip your pull your fingernails out or shock treat you and stuff like that. You know. I, I want to ask you something, and, and it's totally okay if you don't want to um, go there, but. I, I was able to get my hands on a photo uh, from a source, and it looks like there was a point in the 2000s where the leadership of the Detroit mob was holding meetings at your, <laughs> either at your house, <laughs> your law office. Um, I... <laughs> again, you don't have to, you don't have necessarily have to comment, no, it's but it, it, it show it definitely demonstrates the, the level of trust they had with you. Oh, yeah. Um, well, you know, everybody knew I wouldn't talk. I mean, everybody knew. I just was built into this world. You know, I mean, it was a perfect fit. I know I didn't talk. Do we lose Polly? Talk I mean, not to, not like you. I did a couple of things with these guys, and we made money together. But, no, you know, I didn't never kill. I never whacked nobody or had nothing to do with that kind no, of stuff. No, but what I'm saying, though, is that picture shows me Without you telling me this, just me getting my hands on this photo, that the 
I think that the photo was from like 2000 and maybe six. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. She didn't six. allow no pictures there. What happened was, no, I someone can't snapped you a photo and it was like Billy uh, Jackaloni, Alan yeah. Health, Tony Palazzolo, Jack Jackaloni. Right. Yeah. They're all, yeah. And what happened was, I, uh, Jackaloni's daughter, I used to get my hair cut from her husband over in Gross Point. So we had a little connection there. And I asked her one time, I says, I know there's no pictures allowed in, you know, but would you take this picture? Would you orchestrate to take this as a present for a friend of mine? Is what I said. And she did it. Now nobody would screw with her because it's just the, the daughter took it. And right. then she gave me a, a copy of it. So that's what, what, did you, what did you think of Tony Palazzolo? He's a nice guy. That's all I know him as a very nice guy. Very respectful, very nice guy. He was a downriver guy. He, he didn't yeah, really. He know. wasn't from our side of town. I don't know. Yeah, maybe downriver, but he was a very nice guy. And he and was that a, Alan Hilt or whatever his name Alan is. Hilt Alan Hilt was Jackie's best friend, the Jewish bookie. Yeah, and then what's the other Jewish guy they used to bring over? Man, we went on a 98-foot yacht. And I'll never forget this. I thought it was going to be like Donnie Brasco, you know, with the bottles of champagne and the broads and the jacuzzi and all that shit. And, and the old man freaked out because the Jewish guy brought a broad to the boat, you know. And he freaked out. He's like, there's no broads coming to this party. They'll fuck the whole party up, you know. Real old school shit. I'm like, wow, we're going on a yacht and old women. <laughs> That's a trip. <laughs> what business do we need to discuss? <laughs> Am I coming back alive? I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you know that uh, the, the FBI believes that Tony Palazzolo was actually with Billy Jackaloni when Jimmy Hoffa was murdered. So it's hmm. at least that's the belief of the FBI. Uh, Billy Jackaloni was unaccounted for. That afternoon, he, he had shook his surveillance unit. Yeah, he, he's always going to be unaccounted for. Yeah, I, I I just understand from my perspective that he didn't really want to do that, but that order came from New York. Well, it, it definitely uh, was something that you know everybody needed to sign off on. Uh, it wasn't something that you could just do without consensus. So yeah, there was a lot of coordination between Detroit. New York. You know, in the scheme of things, too, you think about it. Here's Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa takes this union pension fund, and then a guy in Chicago does the same exact thing a couple yeah. years later. That right. guy in Chicago? I can't remember his name. Tony Accardo. Yeah. He did the same thing. Right. <laughs> you know. Tony Spilatro uh, and Joey Iupa and Did you hear uh, the most did you hear that most recent? You, you probably didn't hear about it. Uh that that um some old cop from Milwaukee came out a month or two ago and said that Joey Ayupa, who was the Chicago mob boss, had, yeah, yeah, had no, Hoffa's body uh, buried he, under Milwaukee County Stadium. Right. He it's, it's retarded. I don't know. He wants to, somebody wants to get noticed, you know. Another wannabe. Hey, incidentally, have you ever met more wannabe gangsters than the east side of Detroit? I mean, seriously, I lived around the country. Uh, I had a condo in South America. I've been to Europe. I've never met so many wannabe gangsters. <laughs> yeah, it, we could, you know, people talk about, uh, you know, the uh, this kind of Jersey Shore influence in, in the New York youth culture. And, and I would say that the it's analogous to what you have sometimes on the east side of Detroit. Yes. Where these yes. guys could be, have their own absolutely. little Jersey. They could have their own Jersey Shore show. I absolutely kind of agree with you, man. I was a Jersey <laughs> kid. I can't even tell you. I thought, man, I looked out the window. I was, I said, man, New York's just so awesome. I went to Chinatown, Little Italy, and a real Jewish deli, man. Yeah, you know, I was in heaven. And I looked out. I said, man, I didn't realize they have a coastline here with the waves coming. And the guy goes, hey, asshole, where do you think you're at? I go, I'm in New York. He said, no, man, this is Belmar, New Jersey. So I'm like, oh. He goes, New York, that's three hours away, dude. <laughs> I was partying a little bit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. So uh, let's just let people know, like, what – let's talk about your case for a second, and then we'll get to the book. Okay, I am, in we'll fact, know, first... We'll let people know uh, where they can where they can. Get okay, I am, in fact, the first American citizen that's ever been to a federal prison for what they, what I pled to was aiding and abetting drug trafficking where people did some lines of cocaine, thereby creating the possibility that they might do another one. Not necessarily at my house, maybe down the street, maybe at a bar, or maybe on Venus or fucking Mars. I don't know where else. <laughs> but that's what I pled to. 
When I went up to the, they never fulfilled the element of profit. There's never been an allegation over a hundred interviews, not one allegation. So I brought it up to the judge and it's in, it's is on the federal record, by the way, verbatim brought up to the judge. There's no element of profit. And the judge says, no, I disagree. It's what economists refer to as psychic rent. That means I profited in my own mind. So I said, well, ask the judge if I can go to fucking McDonald's, buy a Big Mac, uh, fucking fries and a, and a Coke and pay for it with the profit in my fucking mind. You know, there's my fucking lawyers nodding out in court and shit. You know, <laughs> She said, shut up or you're going to do another two so years. How did, how was the, what's the rationale there that you benefited by somehow uh, these people are going to like you and do you favors because you're giving them cocaine? No, I never gave anybody or introduced anybody. If it, somebody wants to do it, it's I don't know, it's up to them. Yeah, but what, what's the what's the thought process behind psychic? Well, they tried to get me to sign this plea agreement that I set the drug dealer up with customers, which never uh, I wouldn't sign broke, it. They're but I was facing 105 years at the time, and I still wouldn't sign it. Then they they ultimately dismissed that and reindicted me on this aiding and abetting theory. Now, I am for, I'm on the fucking Google. You can just hit the fucking name. I'm the first person ever in the Eastern District of Michigan to do 500 hours of community service, hard labor. They put, I mean, this is two, in the 2000s. They could send you to the hard labor for no money. 500 hours. They only use community service to bar down jail time. They couldn't in my case because I maxed myself out on the guidelines, period. You know, I never thought I was going to go to prison. At least I was told I wasn't. You know, and so uh, they maxed me out on that, and and uh, I still got 500 hours. Uh, the first day on the job, they gave me a sledgehammer. They saw me start knocking out fucking bricks and taking these 50 to 70 pound boxes up two flights of stairs. It it was like I don't know what do you call it excessive. <laughs> I mean, so they so they nailed you for brokering coke deals without actually taking a percentage of the said deal. No, that wasn't no kickback. It's not even alleged that I did that. It's not even a left. But, but if they're saying you're right. aiding and abetting, doesn't the, the, doesn't the aiding and abetting meaning A, you're helping facilitate the deal, and B, the only way you aid and abetting the first charge so Scott, was using an electronic device to facilitate drug trafficking, ordering a gram of cocaine. Now, that's done for people that don't want to touch the product, but they traffic right. it by a computer or a phone. I was not, all I did was order a gram for myself or two. That's all I've ever done. And I, when I was running for judge, you got to remember, I was only a few weeks shy of being a judge. And I I reached out, I told, told the newspapers, I said, despite my prior indiscretions, I'm still the most qualified for this uh, for this judgeship or whatever the fuck you call it. Man. So, <laughs> I was already retired. I didn't need the money or nothing like that. I mean, for where I come from, I was already rich beyond my wildest dream. You know, I got a condo, I got a building, I got a uh, place in uh, you know, whatever, house, all that shit. Uh, everything was just about paid for. So I figured I'll retire and just, you know, give the store away until they kick me off the bench, you know what I mean, for lower working class and hardship cases. So like. so tell people how you started writing the book. Called It's called From Pepperdine to Prison. Yeah. Um, it's a great read. It's a fast read. And you really get an inside look into this. I'm telling you, I, I say this about everybody, but it's it's a it's a – it's different with Paul because again, you're seeing it from a completely different lens. Oh, that's cool. It's a, mo it's a movie script. I mean, it really is. I, you know what? A lot of people tell me that that it's a reason more like a movie. I, I don't know because I watch a ton of movies. I love movies, and I'm just I'm just a movie junkie. And I used to work at 20th Century Fox uh, in uh, California. I got a job there. It was in 1985. Man, I was making twenty dollars an hour, and I never went to the legal. I only went there one time to the legal department. I just walked around watching how they film movies. So, you know. so what was the process like of writing the book? Um, you know, writing the book was not, I don't know, it just kind of came natural to me. My mom used to be a book junkie, so she'd read me books all the time. So my mom was always reading me books ever since I was a kid. And writing was not that hard. Just kind of like, I was kind of, I'm like, I'm out of a job. I'm out of a career. I don't know what to do. Well, maybe, you know, maybe this will be my public service to educate the public, see what comes out. Now, at the time, I was still under federal probation from the threats of the federal government. They're still pulling me over all the time, rousting me and all that other stuff. So I was kind of backed up. I didn't want to get me reindicted. I'm like, if you notice, I was not charged with any bribery. 
no tax evasion. They put in a petition. They didn't get you in for any of public corruption, even though they every were claiming lawyer, that you were this big fixer. Every lawyer, every gangster in the world gets a tax evasion charge right. because we deal in most cash. So my, my when I had to go to the federal government to be audited, I mean, I mean, boxes, three boxes of documents going 10 years back. And the last time when my taxes were filed out, I claimed 267, 287, 313,000. And that's just the checks, my man. Who knows what happened to all that cash? <laughs> Everybody still thinks I got it buried and I'm living on a Michigan bridge car. Okay. I'm living in a van down by the river. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell, you everyone, know. tell everyone where they can get it. Oh, oh my God, it's available. Now it's available on all kinds of mediums. Oh, well, I tell you, the only the only white lie I said in this book is right on the cover. I, I try to make myself look six foot three because <laughs> I'm not six foot three and I never will be. But I just thought it would be funny to do that. But uh, it's available on Amazon or you just go www.frompepperdinaprison.com. And uh, yeah, I got a lot of good feedback because the people that are paying for this, are paying inordinately into this system of corruption. And they're not, it's a very secretive world, just like the mob guys are. You know, the judges are the same way. Listen, this is the, the worst criminals I've ever seen are from judges. The guys that, you know, that you're paying to, to administer justice, fair and impartial. <laughs> it's nothing like that. And I'm not saying all of them. I'm, I'm saying in my, from my view, around 50%. I mean, I could get to a lot of these guys, you know, when he talks, you know what I mean? When you watch a judge steal a 10-pound bag of cheese, what do you think he'll do for real money? When you watch a judge grab one of your envelopes of cash and stick it in his fucking pocket because he thinks you owe him because you're making money in his court, he's taxing you, right? <laughs> what do you think he'll do for real money? Now, I'm not the only one that's happened to. I understand from the editors in New York City, which is the best editing firm, I believe, in the country, Kevin Anderson and Associates, that I'm just the first person to write about this because it's a very secretive world and nobody wants to cut their own throat. In my case, I don't care. I'm old enough. I'm never going to get my law license back. My way of doing things is over. you got to be a realist. You know what I mean? And uh, I figured, uh, why not? I write a book. That, uh, I wrote it like the first half of it. Uh, I started writing. I never owned a computer, a laptop. I never been on social media, none of that. So I, I handled it, and then I got a computer delivered to me. And every day I'd write, Paul is an asshole, Paul is a big asshole, blah, 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 blah. And, and Paul is an asshole, lives a marriage, blah, blah, blah. I learned how to fight. you got to have a good sense of humor to live what you uh, live through what you've lived through, Paul. <laughs> Why not? I mean, what's the other the, I mean, you know, go, go in a fetal position, start sucking your thumb, right. behind, I want my mom and all this shit. Yeah, I felt like being in prison. I did my last six months on solitaire, man, on lockdown, because – they get propagandized bullshit about early release. They gave me the early release at the prison. They called me up to the thing. So where are you going to be ready? you have a ride home when you get out of here? I'm like, that's six months from now. I go, no, that's tomorrow morning. And the next day at 8, 8.15, I was out. I went directly to the halfway house to get a tether. And they locked me down in this uh, room for solid, you know, for COVID and all that shit. So I'm in a room with 14 guys. I sat on a milk crate for three days. Then I finally got up bed. Then after two weeks, I got an infection in my eye. So they allowed me a trip to the hospital. And then they didn't know what to do with me because they're short staff. So they stuck me in like a broom closet with uh, the security screens. So the, the telephone they give you doesn't work or the TV. You know, <laughs> you just sit there and stare at the wall, man, trying to figure things out. And I'm in bad company by myself, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> got 16 personalities that all want to be heard from. And the last one, you need a fucking hockey helmet and a fucking drool bowl. You know what I mean? <laughs> doesn't know that. But so, one thing they underestimated was my perseverance and my faith in God through Jesus the Christ, and that's it. <laughs> Call it whatever you want. What does Buddha say? The best religion is the one that brings you into the light. It yeah. don't matter what path you take. Just try to take a path, man. The goalposts get a little bit, you know, so you don't do nothing bad. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I want to leave. I want to leave on with one quick anecdote that kind yes. of I think encapsulates what Paul's talking about in Macomb County. And I'm not going to mention the names of judges, but I'll just give one situation that popped up in the last decade uh, where you had two guys that are allegedly part of the Sicilian faction of the Detroit mafia. And they were trying to shake down a 
competing business owner that had opened up an Italian restaurant across from their Italian restaurant. Oh, yeah, they beat that guy with the baseball bat. They beat the guy with a baseball bat. I mean, within inches of his life, uh, he's charged in Macomb County for attempted murder. The case gets chopped down to some third degree assault. I'm not exactly sure. I don't want to be misquoted, but it ended up being like, you know, four or five months in county jail and the rest uh, done in home confinement. This really, really upset the feds who felt like there had been some chicanery behind the scenes. They came in and hit him with a Rico based on the same exact occurrence. But at the end of the day, uh, the main, the one brother only ends up doing about 18 months. Well, you got to ask yourself this question, Scott. Yeah. Why does that same judge keep coming up in all these controversial situations? Yeah. You, you, just ask yourself that. And then you, you, had a situ- remember- then you had a situation in the federal court system. And again, I'm not going to mention any names. Right. You don't you have Jack, to. You had Jack knows. Toko, who was the godfather of the Detroit mob, convicted of being the godfather of the Detroit mob, convicted of being the number one defendant in a, in a uh, racketeering conspiracy. Uh, and in a, in a situation where every other contemporary of his around the country would be doing 30 years, he gets sentenced to a year or less. Yeah, right. Two year, year or two year. Right. And he ends up, you know, the feds had to come in and appeal it. He ends up doing like 18 months. But See, the difference is in my case, listen, every Macomb County, Michigan had more indictments than LA County where 10 million people or Cook County, you know. They have more indictments here pending right now, right here and now. This is all current, okay? And every single one of these politicians, save Dean Reynolds, who took his case to trial. He was a low guy in a poll, and he's doing 17 years. All these other politicians, the prosecutor, his assistants, the whole fucking gamut of these people, they're all keeping their pensions. They're all, mm-hmm. Most of them kept their jobs, you know, because they cut deals with the feds. Well, you and mentioned Eric not, Smith. Nobody went to prison. The prosecutor went for a few months and they Smith, let him out. Early. Smith went to prison, right? Right, but they put him down in the, they put him in a camp and he got out early. Nobody. This was the pro- this is the prosecutor that we were talking about earlier in the interview. Yes. that was trying well, to jam you. Was trying to jam you. Meanwhile, he he's brought down in a huge corruption look, case and has to go to prison. Look, I came on the radar in 2011. What I understand is because I threw a fundraiser for Eric Smith because his office dismissed the drug driving that I had. I had a couple of you know anyway so i vowed never to drink and drive again and that was 17 years ago and i never had you know and so i was just grateful and our mothers grew up in the same neighborhood but well, eric smith's half italian you know that right mm-hmm. you know that his uh mom's Italian, and they went to with my mother they went to school together so we had a little connection there and he treated me pretty good he doesn't go to court or nothing but everybody knew what was going on i mean Dude, you can go to the fucking prosecutor's office and buy back an automobile that they seized for drugs or alcohol. It's $1,750. I would go there with $500 in an envelope with a post it and just hand it to him. Give this there. <laughs> you know, they're all taking cash, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not saying what I did was all right, but it was helping a client out and helping somebody with hardships out. Nobody was getting hurt. You know, I mean, say you're Scott Bernstein. You had too many drinks. You came to me. Hey, Paulie, what can you do, man? I can't have this on my record. I work for the Oakland Press or wherever you're working for at the time. Or, you know, okay, with the right amount of money, then we can do this or that. You know, I don't see no harm in that. You know, I mean, you're not, as long as you're going to hit no school bus full of kids and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just. Well, Paul, you just, you just, was, you were an amazing tour guide or, you know, uh, curator to take us in, in, you know, in this journey <laughs> through your life and through the, the halls of this kind of warped justice that we have in Detroit and, and in your, in your relationships and um, experiences with some of these, these big time Detroit mob guys that were tied into the Hoffa case. This was awesome. This was one of my favorite interviews I've done. Paulie, thank you so much. Come for on, me. man. You're, you're awesome. You know, I never in a million years would think I'd be talking to you on a Zoom. I I, I think this is my first time I ever Zoom. I, well, we're going to be, do, we'll do it. We're going to do another in-person <laughs> one. Uh, just for just to tease it out here. Yeah, but you uh, got you got your buddy Steve Fishman, who's one of the best lawyers in Detroit, and yeah. the number one uh, attorney gangster or some shit like that. And I, you know, I called him on the phone after I seen him on the TV to just ask him about something. <laughs> he said, "Hey man, what are you trying to do? Reopen your case?" I go, "No, I'm trying to shut up other people. Just tell me that I don't have a case, okay?" Uh, but, he was pretty cool about it. 
th- this was uh, this was great. And again, we're going to do another one that's going to be for a uh, just for a Detroit media outlet, but okay. we'll also share it on on Original Gangsters podcast, and that will be a little bit probably more centered to, uh, on his case. But sure. uh, that that's okay. going to come up in the next well, let's say, couple months. But this will be on YouTube and on uh, Apple, iTunes, Spotify. Uh, oh, we're, we're we are incredibly. Uh, it's you joining us was very gracious and you know, I and being you, as Scotty. forthright as you've been and and giving us this this great this great insight and perspective. Well, I'm going to just be honest with you too. It's it's never really come up. So I touch on it in the book. Uh, I touch on a lot of things in the book, so some people are aware. But now I'm um, I have the freedom to say whatever I want and whatever. Ask away. I, you know, it's kind of cool. This was awesome. Thank you, Paulie. Have a great You're holidays. Welcome. You too. We'll see you next. We'll see you next week on another long-form episode of the OG Pod. I'm Scott Bernstein.